I want to establish, if I may, I want to establish my groundwork, if I may. I'm going to use two scriptures only. That'll be Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 21, which we read without no comment. And then we will land on, on Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. A lot of people don't understand that the Matthew uh, 11, where he says that, that 11, 28, where he says, my yoke is easy. What does that mean? Now, I'll give you a graph right now. This is part of a yoke. The animals put this, actually this part of it. They have a yoke and they hook up to this. They hook up to this. And this is what pulls the wagon or the, or, or the plow. I want you to see this. And, and I want to bring it to mind. Each and every one of you are carrying one of these, whether you know it or not. Each and every one of you. Life is hard. The yoke is a symbol of subjugation, of servanthood. This is only for beasts of burden. This is, for, this is for donkeys. This is for mules. This is for oxen. This is for water buffaloes. This is for beasts that do all the hard work. Keep that in mind. And I'll show it again just to show and tell and give you that graphic visual. But I want to I wanna share with you for Mark chapter 7. Let me set the situation here. Jesus is, is in, his, in his hometown in Galilee. He's teaching his disciples. By the way, the word for disciples in Spanish is discipulos. In Spanish, a discipulo is a lifetime student. When we say discipulos, we're, we're learners. But in the Hebrew, we have the word tell me, tell me dim, tell me dim, T-A-L-M-I-D-I-M, tell me dim. A tell me dim was a follower of a rabbi. And they wanted to hear everything the rabbi was saying, but also mimicking exactly what the rabbi was doing. His values, his goals, his disciplines. They wanted to emulate to the T. That's why they were disciples. And they were committed to watch their master do whatever it was possible. Basically mimic him, even how he walked, how he talked, how he paused. What did he do? How much he prayed? What did he eat? How long he slept? And they wanted to emulate their master. That's what a disciple is. So here his disciples of Jesus, they're in Galilee. And they're enjoying a wonderful time. And all of a sudden from Jerusalem, we have the religious people coming up. And they make an observation, and this is where the conflict, cultural, religious, comes in. Verse 1 of chapter 7 of the book of Mark. Father, we thank you for this morning. We ask your blessings. We ask your anointing, your enlightenment. Father, that this will just not be a study, Lord, but this will be a life application. That this will be a pivotal turning point for some, if not all of us that are here a pivotal point where we get sick and tired of being sick and tired of everything, and we realize that the yoke that we're carrying is ill-fitting and is killing us, and we'd rather have your own yoke upon us, for it's easy, it's light, and we will find rest for our souls. Be with us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with what kind? With what? Defile, that, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Why? For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. This is, guys, this, they're doing pre-COVID stuff already. <laughs> And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked Jesus, question, why do your disciples not walk or behave according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Jesus answered and said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy so of you, you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. 
for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of man, the washing pitchers and cups and many other things, such things that you do. And he said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, which is one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you Pharisees say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profits you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift to God. So whatever the child owed to their parents, the, the child will say, oh, I'm giving this to God instead of my parents. Verse 12. Then you no longer let him, let him do anything for his father and his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things you do. When he had called all the multitude of himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, these are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples, or his Talmudim, asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but it enters his stomach and is eliminated and thus purifying all foods. And he said to them, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For, who, for from within, out of the hearts of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, uh, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, angel dust. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> All these evil things come from within and defile the man. What's the point here? The Pharisees were into what we call ceremonialism or internalism. But there's a fancy word called formalism. What is formalism? The use of, of, of forms of worship without regard to inner significance. The practice or the doctrine of strict adherence to prescribe or external forms. Ceremonialism, ritualism, and legalism. I wrote here down, they practice minute regulations, prescription, rigorous obligations, restrictions, innumerable traditional observances, absurd minutia, the splitting of hairs, the severity of the law, rite, ceremony, ritualism, meticulous enforcement by those who wouldn't do them themselves. So I came from a religion of, of rites and ceremonies and obligations. I remember doing my first communion. It was supposed to be the first one of many to come. I did my first communion. I had my first confession. I was baptized as a child. They were all rituals. And as long as you, you do those obligations, you enter into the church of Jesus Christ. At least that's what my tradition tells me. But tradition is very wrong. So what you see the Pharisees here using this, this internal formalism, they will bring burdens upon the people. They will not even do it themselves. And so, again, using that, that background, I want you to understand that Jesus was not concerned in, in, in the externals. He says, what you eat and what you drink does not defile you at all. And there are people today, I work with a, a beautiful a co-worker of mine, She's beautiful. Her, her name is Laura, but that's not her real name. Okay? This fictitious name, Laura. Laura was a beautiful girl. And, and she was a, a persuaden of the religion where you worship on Saturdays only. You know where I'm going, right? And she doesn't eat, car, uh, she doesn't eat uh, uh, carnitas, bacon, sausage. So she also, does not, she also does not drink coffee. And she stays away from Coca-Cola, anything that's Coke. And so she's very meticulous about that. So I, I, when she found out I was a Christian, she was joyful. I was too. And it was wonderful to have a co-worker that believes in the Lord. But the problem is that she had a boyfriend. She was living, in with, living with him. 
And she will talk to the other girls, employees, about their sexual escapades. So there was an inconsistency there. But in her mind, she thought, as long as I stay from, from Chile Verde, <laughs> you laugh. Why are you laughing? Because you understand the absurdity. She stays away from Farmer John Lynx because it's pork. Carnitas, oh, Lord Jesus, how can, how, can you, how can you stay from carnitas, Lord Jesus? I leave that religion right now immediately for that. So that's my whole point. So she had a sense of formalism. She was very concerned with what she did and what she did not do, but her moral, in, her moral private world was in shambles because she was in total violation, transgression of what God says. She was not pure. She claimed to be pure, but it was obvious to all the rest of the people that it was just witty, 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 and there was no substance. And the same thing with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were concerned about being on the outside and so forth. Now, I want you to understand that every rabbi, a teacher, Jesus was one. Every rabbi, every rabbi had metaphorically a yoke. Metaphorically. A yoke will be a condition. If you're a rabbi and I'm a rabbi, you have your own yoke. I have my own yoke. The burdens, the obligations that you think your disciples have to do. And so let's say that David is a rabbi too, and he has his own yoke. He has his own set of expectation for his disciples. So when Jesus comes in, turn with me to Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Now here in Matthew 28, if you read it in context, which we are not, I hope you can do your homework. But in verse 28, there's the invitation. Listen very careful. I know you heard this before. But I want you to read it very slow, methodically, in the context that I just shared with you. Come to me. First of all, all. That's, that's inclusive. Not exclusive. All. All. And here's the condition, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. So he is reaching out to people that in the, that in the Greek word is called polortiso, which means spiritual anxiety. Now, if I was to ask you personally, what's your head trip right now? What's your head trip? Everybody has a head trip right now. Every one of us. If it's not marriage, children, grandchildren, if it's not that, is your job, is your health. Some of you are burying your parents. Some of you just bury your parents. Some of you are going through financial disarray. Some of you are losing your hair and you're so freaked out. Take it from me. It happens. Don't worry about it. Some of you are reaching 40 years old and you say, oh, men, middle age. That's right. You're getting old. Some of you are 60, 70 years old, 80 years old. You're thinking, what's life all about? And so as we get older, all of us, we get philosophical. We start thinking about life. What's the next move? Do I have enough to retire? What's, what's it all about, Alfie? I'm doing all my life. This is, I'm, I'm sick and tired of all this. And it's a burden. You want to reach goals. See, this, this is an alter ego. This is, this is your ego. This is who we are. Right? The one with no teeth right here. That's it. <laughs> the one bald and we're gaining weight and we're growing in the Lord the opposite way. <laughs> This is us. This is you. This is the one that doesn't cuss. This is the one that's nice. This is the one that wants to be like Jesus. And it's okay to, to have that because that's the alter ego. That's where I want to be. But if your alter ego is really way out here, and then life is unbearable because you, you resign yourself to say, I can never be this person. I can never be. And if it's too low, that you ever heard low, low self-esteem? When you, it's too low, you say, I'm nothing. And you capitulate, you give up on life, you give up on merit, you give up on, on give it the zest of life. Jesus said, come unto me, all of you that are exhausted. All of you that are carrying a yoke. And he said, take my yoke upon you. And what? Learn from me. So here's the key. 
Jesus was not saying to you, David, may I use you? Come over here for a second. Forgive me. I'm not going to call you an ass, okay? I mean, just... That's a donkey. So you're carrying it. Put it, hold it right there. So here's Jesus. Jesus is not saying, David, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the yoke off of you. Jesus was not saying that. But Jesus was saying, I'm going to give you a new equipment. It's another yoke. But this yoke is mine. And this yoke, this yoke is easy. I'm going to yoke with you. And there's Jesus. <laughs> you know, when I got busted, I was going to L.A. County Jail. <laughs> they took me to the big bus, to the glass house. And we were chained up to one another. Anybody's done that? No? Not here in Fontana? No, no. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. When in Montebello, everybody does it. Yeah. And, and so when we're bound together, we're riding that bus, and we get out in less than an hour and a half. I already know what he did to get in here. I know his wife's name. I know what gang he's from. You know, I, I know everything about him if we're, if we're honest to each other. Why are we talking? Because we're hooked up. And we're in fellowship, whether we like it or not. And so when Jesus was saying, thank you, Dave, thank you so kindly. Now, so when Jesus was saying, I'm not going to take the yoke off of you. I'm just going to exchange it, and I'm going to give you my yoke. Because in life, the burdens of life, think about the burdens of life. Sex, marriage, being a father, being a husband, being a son, being a brother. Being an uncle, working or no work, or perhaps you have workers under you. Think of all the burdens that come to you every single day. They're a pain. They're a burden. It just suffocates you to the point where you're carrying the load, and you see people who don't know Jesus, and you see their faces, they're exhausted. You see their eyes bulging out. And the way they say things, you know, whatever comes out of the man's mouth is what's in their heart. For whatever comes out of the mouth is the heart speaks. So when you hear a man saying, you know what, man, F this, F that, man, French fry this, French fry that. You realize that that's, that's the root of their lives. And the fruit is the language. Because they're portraying what's inside here. That's why Jesus said, what goes into your mouth does not defile you. My young boy, he's now 31 years old. He was in Little League, and he had three coaches. And so I got there early. I thought I can, you know, be nice to the coaches. I went, I went to Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks. I don't believe in, in that expensive coffee. I go to Jack in a Box and McDonald's. That's the best coffee ever. Don't. <laughs> but I went to Starbucks as a sacrifice. <laughs> And I went and took three coffees with a little specialty, and I took them to the coaches and, and looked to them as if I had just given them vomit. They looked at it and go, no, thank you. And I said, whoa, cold shot dudes, man. Wow. Then I found out that they were Mormons. Oh. I didn't know that. Now, Chuck Smith came from the Depression era. He came from a Foursquare denominational church. In, in, in that era, they, were, they used to call the show, they used to call it the picture house. And no four square boy would go to the picture house. They would not even go to dance. They would not even put any kind of wine, not even vin vinegar, because there was wine. This is how strict they were. Chuck came in with that, with that and all the boys, they got saved, we, you know, we stood away from those things because he was taught from the pulpit. He was our master. We were his disciples, and we wanted to emulate him. But there was a problem. I'm Mexican. We dance. <laughs> I'm telling you. And so when I got saved, my mom said, Miko, let's dance. Let's dance. No. I don't dance no more. <laughs> Why? I go, because, because it's not cool. Because it's like we're shaking our body and I'll just give her some kind of reason. And she goes, ah, that's mental. You're dumb. <laughs> and I was, but I was living that life. 
And then when I left, I went to a Baptist church in East L.A., and I was there for three years. That's where I got married. And that's where we learned once again the strictures. When I said, we're going to get married, I said, we're going to have mariachis, and then we're going to have a salsa band. The pastor said, oh, salsa band? Do they have congas? You mean congas. <laughs> they have congas? Well, yeah, salsa band is, you have to have congas. Hello? He goes, those conga drums are from the devil. <laughs> I kid you not. And the mariachis? They're tequila-inducive music. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> but, but my wife's Puerto Rican. I'm Mexican, and she wants to have salsa. I want to have mariachis just for the sake of our families. Well, the churchianity, the culture in church did not allow me, and it was a lousy wedding. We are waiting for our 50th year. I'm 40, it's going on 47 years. On our 50th year, we're going to have a salsa band and mariachis. We're going to party like it's 1975. And so, again, the burden that Jesus was speaking about, he's speaking to Jewish people. They understood. You see, they were disciples of the Pharisees in a way. So... The Hebrew word for disciples, Talmudim, which basically means an apprentice. What's an apprentice? A person who is learning the practice, uh, who is learning the trade from a skilled employer, having agreed to work for a fixed period at low wages. This word stresses the relationship between rabbi and disciple. A Talmud of Jesus' day would give up his entire life in order to be with his teacher. The disciple didn't only seek to know what the teacher knew, as usually the case today. It was not enough just to know what the rabbi said. But the foremost goal of any Talmudim was to become like the rabbi and do what the rabbi did. The whole point of apprenticeships was to model all of their life after Jesus Christ. Come and follow me. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. Do what he would do if he were you. And so... Again, they were not just hearing. They were watching what he did. In a moment, we'll finish this invitation. But I want you to know that, and I'm not trying to show off, please. I beg of you. I just want to let you know that I got saved at the age of 25 years old, and I began to read English at the age of 28 years old. By God's grace, he took me back to school. I went to East LA College. I graduated. I went to Cal Poly Pomona. Did two years, and the Lord got a hold of me, and he says, go to Bible school. Forget this agriculture stuff. <laughs> and I went to Bible school. And that's when I learned the wonderful wonderment of reading. I read biographies. I'm reading Mr. Dwight Eisenhower. Now, what I'm interested in, well, I'm interested in biographies. I put a couple of notes down here. Famous people, luminaries, celebrities, superstars, men or women, they left a mark in our, in our society. We read their stories, not just to know their life stories, but to know about them and to be like them or to make sure we don't want to be like them. You know, if you're reading a book, you know, you're reading a book by, by, by uh, the Hillside Strangler, you know, you don't... You don't, want, you don't want to copy what he did. But I don't get those kind of books. I, I, I prefer biographies of men and women, preferably men who are leaders. And so we do not look at what he or she said. We look at how he or she lived, the details of their day-to-day, -day, their habits, their life, their values, their morals, their virtues, their routines, education, the upbringing, pivotal, pivotal life moments, and disciplines. So this man... He's one of seven boys. He comes from a Mennonite family. He, so he left his Mennonite ways, but he always retained the formality of Jesus Christ in his heart. On D-Day, when he committed millions of souls into the invasion, he prayed, God, I hope that you're with me in this decision. And it was May 5th, June 5th. And when was, when was D-Day? June what? 6th. It was supposed to be the 5th. 
But Eisenhower saw the weather and he canceled everything. Think about it. The gall and the confidence to change D-Day to the next day because there was weather. And everybody was shooken up. But they trusted him. And sure enough, on that day, D-Day, they had the best weather recorded in all of that year. And D-Day happened. My whole point is that I don't care what he says. I want to know, what did he do? What is his habits? What are his values? What are his traditions? What, what does he do? I want to know. You see, it's easy for you and I to show, like the Pharisees, the external. Like, this is what I do. I pray. I go to church. You see me here. I'm here. But it's who you are when no one sees you. And you can play that game. Say, you know what? I love, no, when I'm here, I'm hallelujah. I'm going to talk like this. I'm going to do this. And that's not cool. When I get out of the pulpit, I am the same way with you out of the pulpit. I'm behind the pulpit. I know men, they're in the pulpit. They're powerful. They're convincing. And I sound like, eh. <laughs> And there are people, and I want you to understand, you need to be careful. Sometimes you have your own yoke. This is the way I run. This is the way I roll. And you don't want Jesus. Yo, he said, I'm fine with mine. And when you continue with yours, you realize that it's going to be damning. Oh, there's a road that seems right for a man, but in the end, it brings forth destruction and death. You're going to be disillusioned because you're saying that your ways are better than God's. What you're saying is that you're so smart, you went to school, or you know how to live on the street, you're better than what God has for you, and you do your own agenda to your own demise. Or worse, you have the yoke of someone else put it on you, and you're doing it only to their expectations. I want to do this because I make sure you're, you're happy in what I do. I am staying away from wine. I am staying away from beer. I've lost people because they come in at church and they say they're workers. They're, they work hot. The weather in L.A. is worse, but in L.A. it's like 80, 90. They're, they're, they're outside. They're working hard. It's hot. And one homeboy opens up an igloo, right? And it's full of ice and beer. And one of the workers, a Christian, took some. He said, I'm, I'm thirsty. He drank it. He felt so damn and so convicted that he went and told me I got to get out of ministry. I thought, what, did you kill somebody? <laughs> what did you do? Did you do a drive-by? What, what happened? Did you slap your wife or your kids? No, no, I had a coarse beer, man. I said, I admire your conviction. But this is it? Man, get your badge, go back to work in the ushering, get back. Are you kidding me? Don't let the enemy fool you. So you're so minutia because you had a little beer in a hot day and that your testimony was wrong? Get out. It's not, it's not that. It's that you repent. You say, Lord Jesus, you teach me. I smoke weed. I, that's my testimony. I smoke weed. I became a Christian and everything went out. Everything. Being bilingual, I was bicultural. I was bi drinker. Johnny Walker, <laughs> Jose Cuervo. Both of those guys went out of my life immediately. But I'm telling you, Cheech and Chong never left me. I kept saying, you know what? I read the book of Genesis and God created everything green. And I believed in it. And one day, when God just said, flick it. Even God said, flick it. On that, it. it's gone gone do i like it yes do i need it no i'll be honest with you there's some people who say oh you don't weed out you know said, hey. shut up <laughs> one day i was walking with with my one of my kids and i was in, in, in venice beach i was walking and and i saw on the floor one of the biggest fattest joints i've ever seen in southern california <laughs> I saw it, and I, I, I had my kid with me. I go, oh, hurry, just go over there. I'll, I'll meet you right now. What are you going to do there? <laughs> so I went back. I looked at it. You know, looked at it. Looked at it. Looked at it. 
And I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to bother nobody. You know, it's just, it's just me, Lord Jesus. When I get that, I talk to you even much sweeter. <laughs> so walked away from it, Renee. Walk away, Renee. I walked away. Then I had another thought. Oh, heck no. If I'm not going to have it, nobody's going to have it. I stepped on it. I crushed it. I was so happy. However, I was sad that I even contemplated for almost a minute and a half. That means that it's still there, still lingering there. The desires are still there. That's why you have to have spiritual disciplines. What are spiritual disciplines, if I may? A discipline is any activity I can do by direct effort that will eventually enable me to do that which currently I cannot do by my direct effort. Let me explain that again. Let me read that again. A discipline is any activity I can do by direct effort that will eventually enable me to do that which I currently I cannot do by my di direct effort. You see... When you go into the military, and I hate to bring this up, I always have to, but when we go into boot camp, they call that the inculcation process or indoctrination. They take a 17, 18 year old kid and transform him. He's from Fontana. He don't know jack about arms and weapons. He doesn't understand about discipline. And all of a sudden, he goes into boot camp, and everything changes. The first thing they want to do in boot camp is take your individuality out. That's the first thing. They want to take your ego out. Because now you're going to be a team member. It's not an I in the team. And they take that individuality, and then discipline comes in. Re repeat. Repetition, repetition, yelling, subjecting you to pain, and you run, and you run, and you cannot run. You vomit, and you keep on running. You keep on lifting weights. And then after the second week, in the third phase, we see that we, we, we're, 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 we got muscles. And, and we're, we're getting tan, and we can do now 40 push-ups in one minute. We can go off the rope in less than a second and a half, and we can realize we can run long distances. We realize I can run three miles in less than 19 minutes. And you realize when I first came to boot camp, I couldn't do that. Discipline does that. You must have discipline. You must have discipline. The doctor told me, you know, you're pre-border diabetic. I go, what the heck? What do you mean I'm pre-diabetic? He says, sir, you're, you're 70. So what? And everything runs down at 70. Oh, so what do I have to do? And he says, burritos, man. They're out. You mean my breakfast wraps? <laughs> yep. So guess what? I don't eat them. I love to, but they're bad for me. Chorizo is not because I'm a seventh day Adventist. <laughs> because chorizo is bad for me. So I have to do things that bring forth discipline. And discipline comes when we're obedient to God. Just exchange the equipment. Notice what Jesus said in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What, what are we going to learn from him? For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Wait a minute. You don't want to teach me how to be a powerful speaker? How to be a suave communicator? You want me to talk like suave and be important in life? No. I just want you to be meek. What is the word meek? Meek means enduring injury and patience and without resentment. Meekness. Lowly means humble, free from self-assertitude and pride. Pride is your enemy, man. Pride is your enemy. How many here are married? How many? Okay. Okay. I'm, okay. So if those in Montebello, they already know, they already know the 12 words. That we have people here from Montebello. I smell them. <laughs> 12 words. Now, if you never heard the 12, how many have never heard the 12 words of marriage? You've never heard of them. Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, Josh, that was a good study, by the way. Love you. Thank you so much. But Josh, I got something over you. All right. You go home to your wife. Wait when your wife and you have an argument. Just wait. 
And then you kick in these 12 words, okay? Now, if you have pride, it will prohibit you. If you have lots of hubris and cockiness and arrogance, they cannot come. You see, people that are proudful, can I say the first three words, okay? Here's the three words. If you have pride, you don't know how to say it. I am sorry. They don't know how. It's not in them. And that's what Jesus is saying. Learn from me. And you put my yoke. My yoke is easy. My yoke is light. Learn from me for I'm meek and lonely in heart. And when you apply my appliance, my yoke to you, you will find rest for your sukis. Excuse me. Sukis. That's for your souls. The word suki comes from the word psychological. So pride. Pride is corrosive to your mind, to your heart, to the way of Jesus Christ. Pride is something that man and God have common together. God hates it, and man hates it. Do you appreciate a man who's cocky? They come in and you go, hey. You hate him. This, this, this is the cocky. And Jesus said, get rid of that. Learn from me. I am God. I'm servanthood. I'm lowly and meek. And you will find rest for your souls. For your your yoke is easy. And my burden is light. All of us are going to carry yoke for the rest of our lives. And maybe the yoke that you're carrying is not even yours. It's someone else. Maybe you're seeing a cha-cha girl who who brainwashed you. Her name is Ramona, which is a fictitious name. Now, Ramona, you know, she's a cha-cha girl. She's not even a Christian. Fictitious, right? And she goes, oh, you know, oh, do you have to go to church? Is it, let's, let's go to the lake. Let's go to the park. Let's get carne asada. Hi. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're doing things for her. She put a yoke on you. Or perhaps you put the yoke on yourself. You say, I'm going to do my own agenda. I'm, this is the way I'm going to roll. But, but the 12 words, before I forget them, 12 words. You get into an argument with your wife, try it today. You, when you get into an argument, and don't start an argument, you have to practice these words. <laughs> but you get into an argument. You'll be the first one to say, 12 words, honey, I am sorry. The next three, I was wrong. The next three, it's my fault. I love you. Now, stand by a phone. You may have to call 911 because she's going to drop on you. Pow! <laughs> what was that all about? You see, pride will prohibit you. Pride will not be able to sustain you. So what Jesus Christ was saying here, that by putting his yoke, he's not taking the yoke away from you. He's replacing it with a new equipment. But the yoke is only metaphorically. How can we do those things that they're not in us by nature? Ah, this is where the Holy Spirit, the agency, the power, the office of the Holy Spirit will come upon you to to do things you thought you would never do because the power of God comes upon you. You see, you you know the difference between reformation and transformation? Reformation means this. Making changes to something with the intention of setting it back in the right path. An example of a reformation is a drug addict giving up drugs. Okay? That's reformation. I give up drugs. And some people are successful. They're able to take the bull by the horns and say, you know what? It's over with. They have some kind of crisis or they had, they had a wake-up call. They had a death in the family. And they realized the drugs and alcohol were the problem. And they cut it immediately. Good for them. But a lot of us cannot do that. We need intervention. Now, this reformation programs. Let me give an example of reformation. You go, to, you, go, you go to London. From LAX, you go direct flight to London. There's no smoking. If you're a smoker, you can't smoke there. So you reform for the next 11 hours. You reform yourself. It's not that you don't smoke. You, don't, you, you can't smoke because you can't smoke. You're reforming. Transformation is very different. It just means a transformation is caused by supernatural powers. 
The book of Acts describes this divine power that modifies moral character. Moral character does not come by, by doing things. If, if I go to church, and if I give tithe, and if I stay away from carne chile verde, and I stay away from bacon, uh, if I don't cuss, uh, if I say hi to people in the free, they give me the finger, uh, uh, and then that's it. No. Modification of character comes with the cooperation of you willing and yielding to put on the yoke of Jesus with the Holy Spirit come upon you. Yeah. See, I come, from, I come from a church where we, we learn a lot of theology and a lot of ethics, but not lifestyle. Not lifestyle. Not lifestyle. The moment I, I talk to people, they realize you're different. One of the greatest compliments I have ever received from people, like I go to clinics, they say, are you loaded? <laughs> now, let me explain to you why I think it's a compliment. Because they think that I'm taking some kind of medication. They're thinking that somehow I, I'm inebriated or I got a little shot because I am polite. I am kind. I am full of goodness. Apart from Jesus, I am not. But when I go out into the world, I say, Lord Jesus, be with me. Guide me. Watch my mouth. Let me represent. And when I talk to people, they see it. They feel it. Don't think that because you're there in a wedding. I'm old now. For many years, I would go to weddings and I would stay away from the toast. You know, oh, no, I'm a pastor. You know, I wanted just to make a, a scene. You know, I'm a pastor. I don't want anybody catching me drinking a little shot. Of... I'm thinking, I'm in a neighborhood in a festive society. And now, from the last five years, you can, you can tell anybody that I don't care. I'm living the life of Jesus. I celebrate with people. I don't get loaded with them. Cheers. La tuya, la tuya, everybody, hey. <laughs> Little shot. If people are going to say, oh my God, what hey, get up. I'm celebrating. I know. Some of you are looking at me like, what? Now, I'm not saying drunkenness. I'm not taking act stupid. I'm speaking celebratory, festive, festive. My wife had cancer. She was dying. And as she was dying, she wasn't eating anything. And the doctor said, why don't you try a little bit of wine? My, my wife never drank wine. Before she came to Jesus, she was a, she, she was a, a uh, uh, Bacardi 151 girl. <laughs> With rum, coke, and a little bit of lime. That was her. She never took wine. So she was dying, and she had brain cancer, getting chemo in her brain. And they said, just try a little wine. So we said, oh, man, okay. Give me some red wine. And, and then we'll hide it. For years, we did that. My wife would take a shot of wine. Go, oh, yeah, but it gives me hungry. So we got to deal with the guy. He said, why don't you give me wine and a coffee cup, all right? Why a coffee cup? Don't worry, it's too lengthy. <laughs> so for around three years of, of, of chemotherapy, my wife just started drinking wine. And, 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 and one day, someone saw her. And my wife was devastated to the point where she was crippled. She was like, I, I, I let someone down. And I'm saying, listen, we're dying. And we're going to be attentive to other people's accommodations. They're putting the yoke on us. We're free in Jesus Christ. <laughs> die in peace. We thought she was going to die. Die in peace. My whole point is this, man. Let no one voice things on you. This is what you've got to do. Learn Jesus. Learn his ways. Learn what he says. Learn what he does. And I close with this. Listen. Someone said, much of trouble comes from dispositions opposite to humility. Two, humility is the best security against heartaches. Three, Christian humility is opposed to that spiritual pride, which is the worst of all prides. So you don't drink wine. Does that make you a better person? So you don't listen to war. That makes you a better person? You don't eat carne, carne de, de puerco or the pork meat that makes you a better person. You don't drink coffee that makes you a better person. You come to church twice a week that makes you a better person. No, it's how we live our life. What would Jesus do? 
What would Jesus do? We are the hands. We are the feet. We are the eyes. We are the hands of Jesus Christ. Nobody cares what you say. You ever heard that old saying? Hey, it's not what you say, but it's what you do. Go out and do. Go out and be. Don't fake anybody out. Be yourself. Father, we thank you.